I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler, uh, SEC Media Days edition. Will, did you get to check out uh, some of the interviews today at, at Hoover? A little bit. It was uh, a little bit touch and go since, you know, we, we have real jobs and all that sort of stuff. But uh, <laughs> but it and the other thing is, is it's a whole bunch of lies. So we're going to go over all the lies in, in four different segments today and sort of break it down. But uh, it's nice to have new content. It's nice to have something new to talk about. And certainly instead of just saying, well, who, how good is Emory Jones going to be for the next six six weeks? We get to actually talk about what Mullen says about Emory Jones. So it's a it's a good time it's signal that the football season's right around the corner and so some interesting things to talk about that's absolutely the best part about it in general so that it's it's good to it's good that you get it like you're smelling football season now it's starting to get close but uh before we jump in you want to make a quick announcement with the show yeah, yeah man yeah so we're we've gotten to four thousand hours on youtube we need to get to a thousand subscribers to begin to monetize this we're at 841 right now so if you if you're listening to this and you like it please like please subscribe share it with other people we really appreciate everybody's support thus far um, the other thing is we're looking for sponsors so if if you own a business and you're interested in in sort of getting in bed with us and trying to figure out how to do some unique things to reach your audience um, certainly we'd be interested in hearing from you it's, you know you can hit us up on on twitter um, or or you can hit me at my email, will at readingreaction.com. We've got, like I said, we've got some unique things we can do, I think, to reach your audience. So um, reach out to us if you if you think it might work. We can do something, try it out, and see if it works. And like Will said, we're appreciating all the support so far. and We're looking forward to diving into football season with everyone here. So on this w- week's episode, we'll cover uh, Greg Senke, not messing around at SEC Media Days. Is there a QB competition still in Gainesville? Mullen suggested SEC schedule fix, and Will Miles actually defends Dan Mullen's recruiting on Twitter. We'll get to that with the dollar, but let's start out with two bits. Will, Commissioner Sankey, he says straight up, there's no makeup games due to due to any COVID this year. He announced at his opening speech at SEC Media Days today that only six of the conference's 14 football teams have reached 80%, the 80% vaccination mark. He said that number needs to grow and grow rapidly. We have learned how to manage through a COVID environment, but we do not yet have control of a COVID environment. It's not a political football, and we need to do our part to support a healthy society because as we look back, the potential absence of college sports last year caused us to think about not losing sight of the lifelong experiences, the laboratory of learning that takes place, and the educational benefits that accrue to the people who participate on our teams. I understand exactly what he's doing here. He's just trying to, I, I mean, I was a little surprised when I heard six of the 14, then this is not a political statement at all. I, I just, I, I just figured with going back to college campuses, people not wanting to mess around with the season. I, I figured that the football teams would be, mostly vaccinated to so to hear six of the 14 teams are under the 80 percent mark that surprised me will how'd you feel about that i mean i guess i'm a little bit surprised because i figured that the coaches would have been pushing it and when you think about the way that the football teams tend to operate in terms Mm -hmm. of trying to make sure that people think about the team over themselves and, and that sort of stuff i can envision a scenario where where it wouldn't be required, but you know, you think about all the voluntary workouts that you went through when you were even in high school and how those weren't really voluntary because unless you were a star, you were sitting on the bench. If you didn't make it to the voluntary workouts, I kind of figured this is how that would be. But I mean, I understand why a 19 year old kid would sit there and say, I'm at zero risk here. I mean, what's the point in, in, in having a vaccine if there are questions about it. And, you know, again, don't want to get into the politics of the vaccine, but I can understand why somebody who's 18, 19, 20 years old would look at it and say, yeah, I'm not sure that one's for me. But again, you figure that the coaches and the coaching staff and all those guys, especially, and and they're going to do stuff like they're doing in the NFL, I'm sure, where they make the guys eat separately, they have to wear masks, where they have to get repeated tests and all sorts of different things that are going to make it harder on the guys who aren't vaccinated. So I suspect that number is going to increase. And, uh, you know, now's really sort of the time you got to do it because you got to get the first shot and then the second shot. What about a month later? So you'd be getting that second shot middle of August, right as as two-a-days start. I'm not sure. Maybe that's the strategy. Get the first shot now. And then when the first day of two-a-days starts, you can beg out of a couple of days because you just got the second shot. 
Yeah, I mean, I to me, I, I would have figured that this would have been something that they were on top of uh, really as soon as it came out. But I guess some of them are taking it down to the wire. Um, I, I obviously too, there's no guarantee just because you have the vaccination. There's no guarantee that you're not gonna get COVID again. I mean, that we're seeing that too. But I, I, I understand where Sankey's coming from though, because. He's sitting here looking at it. I think. I think. What's he supposed to do right now? I think he he clearly wants this to happen. He's, he doesn't want football season to be messed with. The safest path is through vaccination. And I think what he is just trying to do is send a really strong message today. Like, hey, don't come to, to us asking when your offensive line is rolled out for a week. Don't come to us asking for a makeup game. Get it together right now. So I think he's sending that strong message today in July to to really make that as clear as possible. Yeah, I mean, you know the rules, right? I mean, right. Th- that's that's sort of a. There's been a lot of that recently, where you know we had the the recent Olympian who got popped for marijuana, and then there were a bunch of people saying, "Well, we should let her go anyway." It's like, okay, she knew the rules beforehand. There have been a bunch of examples of that, and in this case, if the commissioner and the rest of the conference has agreed that these are the rules, then the players can choose to do it, choose not to do it, and you know, they get to make their own choice. Nobody's forcing them to do it. At the same time, there are consequences for not doing it. Again, I understand that there are political ramifications to this. The South in general has been less vaccinated than some other areas. There are also racial dynamics to it. So the African-American community has gotten vaccinated less than other communities. And there are some reasons for that as well that are that are sort of steeped in history here. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not going to go out there and tell somebody what to do. Um, I've had COVID. I've also been vaccinated. Um, That was a choice I made, but I'm also almost 40 years old, right? I'm not a 20-year-old athlete who feels like he's invincible. And Mm -hmm. quite honestly, when it comes to the COVID virus, is pretty much (laughs) invincible when it comes to the ramifications to them. There are ramifications to other people, but, uh, you know, again, I, I think Sankey from the standpoint of setting the rules, setting, establishing how it's going to be, and then not letting anyone complain about it. It's kind of what he did to the big 10 last year. Right. I mean, he basically said, no, we're going forward big 10, you do what you want, but this is what the sec is going to do. And last year I liked the decisiveness of Sankey. So I think it's a little bit difficult for me then to criticize his decisiveness this year. People have a choice. They may not like the choice that they're put in, but they have a choice and that's the way it works. Yeah, I mean, at, at some point, I think I think the push toward uh, you know bringing things back to as normal as possible, even though we're going to deal with some complications still in this environment. I mean, I look at it this way: if we got through twenty twenty, we'll get through this year just fine. Like, I mean, maybe there's going to be an issue or two here or there, but uh, I, I don't see it being anywhere close to what twenty twenty was. And I do see, uh, you know, I, again. Are they going to be testing like they were in 2020? I like, I'm not sure how all that's going to work anyway. So I think there's going to be less instances where the entire offensive line has been contact traced or something like that. So I, I think we're in for a relatively normal regular season. You feel in the same way? I mean, I don't know. It looks like there's a little bit of an uptick now. The there was some news that came out today about number of vaccinated people being the majority of the people going to the hospital. But that's kind of a numbers game because if you get 60 or 70 percent of the population vaccinated, then the number of people who are going to go to the hospital are going to be from that vaccinated population just because there's a smaller non vaccinated population out there. So you got to got to actually sort of look at the numbers when you think about that. But there's no doubt that there's some breakthrough infections that there's risks associated even you know with the disease even if you've been vaccinated and so there might be some weird stuff that goes on. There's also been some you know the blood clotting type stuff that's been um, very, very rare with, mm-hmm. with these vaccines is still something that as a high level athlete, I think you need to be aware of, or at least cognizant of. Um, that's the other thing is I hope that they're monitoring people appropriately to make sure that, you know, the, the, the concern with COVID at, at somebody who's 19, 20, 21 years old, isn't survival for the most part. It's, it's usually the myocarditis and, and the other complications that arise from it. And I still don't feel normal four months later. And so, you know, that, that can happen to people who get it and, and you want to, you want to prevent that obviously as best you can. So um, again, I, I think the, the vaccine is approved for people in that age group. You have to, in my view, you got to trust the people who are in charge of, of establishing those safety protocols if you don't, you have the choice, and, you know, the, the choice, you have a choice. You may not like the choice, but you have a choice. And that's, like I said, that's just the way it is. 
Yeah, I have, I have a, see, a feeling we'll see that number rise as we uh, get close to this season here. But like you said, uh, time, time is a factor. And Mullen was even asked about it up front, and he said, I'm not going to get into that. So <laughs> he did not give the specifics of what's going on in Gainesville. But I'm sure with these guys on campus in the season around the corner, uh, conversations uh, will be had. But anyway, let's get let's get into onto the football field here, Will. Let's move on to fourth bits. Uh, Dan Mullen. Made an interesting comment. Just his opening statements, he, he was talking about, he kind of made he had this interesting quote. He said, Anthony Richardson is uh, might be competing for the starting job still. I thought it was a little strange. It didn't sound like there was a firm commitment to Emory Jones just yet. And then I was even asking him, like, has he officially announced that Jones is a starter? I, I don't think I've actually heard that. So he w- Mullen actually said, we have a couple of quarterbacks to have experience. Emory Jones is coming back and Anthony Richardson is competing for that job with him. But then he went on to tout that if you look at Emory Jones, he has experience and he kind of went on to mention that he didn't say anything about Richardson again. Is that just the way we have to talk in, in the, in the world of transfer portals that, that we can't say that Emory Jones, who's been here longer on campus and has earned the opportunity to start is the clear cut starter that everybody's up for everybody's just competing for spots at all times now. I mean, that, that's an interesting reason for, for doing it, I suppose. Um, I, I hadn't really thought about it that way because I was sitting there thinking, I'm not sure. Dan Mullen has never been real nice to Emory Jones in the entire time he's been there, at least when it's come to his interactions with the media. I mean, you, you think about sort of the his, his freshman year, he was sort of cagey about how he was going to redshirt him. You know, they had him coming in for sort of like set packages. I know he came in against Georgia, but they were sitting there. And then, and then when Felipe Franks went out, I mean, he, he, he announced Franks was the starter very early on in 2018. He announced Franks was the starter in 2019. Did a lot to build his confidence, by the way. And then he announced Trask was the starter in 2020. And, and so the fact that, that he's not announcing that he's the starter, I don't know. Right. I mean, what, what does it mean? It, it's, it's a lack of clarity. Now maybe it's, it's Mullen's way of pushing Emory Jones buttons and sort of saying, Hey, I'm going to give him an extra little push that I think he needs or, or something like that. But it's a departure from, from what he's done in his time at Florida thus far. And I think a noticeable one, right? I mean, it's not, it, it's not as though we're sitting here going, well, he's always had a competition. It's always been an open competition. No, he's pretty much established who his quarterback was going to be real early on. And we just, whether we agreed with it or we didn't, that was what we had. And, you know, it it says something. Now, Kyle Trask played really, really well the last two years. So people, I think, forget that it was really a surprise when he came in against Kentucky. I think we all kind of expected the Emory Jones experiment to happen then when, when Felipe Franks got injured. And instead, Kyle Trask came in and started playing lights out. Now, you know, the, the logical criticism there is, well, why, why wasn't Trask playing to start with, right? So, you know, from an evaluation standpoint, a lot of times I'm not sure that you know what you've got until the guy goes out there and, and shows what happens when the lights go on. And so, you know, they're prob- I, I'm assuming they're going to play Richardson quite a bit, especially when they get ahead in some of those early games. And then, you know, who knows? I mean, <laughs> Mullen knows what he's seeing in practice. And if Richardson is close, you, you can't – you can't pull the wool over your player's eyes. If it's really that close or if Richardson's playing better than Jones, then you can't just go, well, I'm going to give the guy with seniority the ability to play and, and, and not have competition because then what do you say to the defensive end or to the corner or to the safety who's got seniority, but you know, is getting passed by a true freshman who's coming in or something like that. So again, I, I think it's probably a minor deal. I think Emory Jones ends up playing an awful lot. I think they're going to, the two quarterback aspect of it is, is, that so nobody's surprised when Anthony Richardson comes in and so that the defense has to prepare for both of them, right? That that you show a couple of things maybe against USF where you've got both of them on the field at the same time, um, you know, and then all of a sudden Alabama has to prepare for that. And then you have the opportunity to hit something big because you're able to trick them maybe in in Gainesville or something like that. Yeah. I I'll tell you, I fully expect Jones to start. This is definitely a minor comment that we're picking on. We're, we're, we're looking, we're probably over evaluating this comment. Um, I, I do look at it though, and I just found it a little bit interesting that he used that. Maybe that's just coach speak. Everyone's competing for jobs at all times around here. It's the University of Florida, right? You want the best guy to play. I think Emory Jones has shown enough, though, in his time that he's gotten in. I mean, it's not like we haven't seen him throw the ball either. He's, I, I think to me, he's shown enough. 
Yeah, you go back. I think Mullen even mentioned it today at, uh, at Media Days in one of the interviews he did where he was talking about um, the, the Auburn series, right? The couple of series against Auburn when Trask went down a couple of years ago where Jones stepped right in and, and played a big role in that game. I think Jones is going to be the guy. I think we're going to see Richardson in different packages, though. I can't Richardson spell Jones a little bit, give him a break in the running game. I don't know how big Jones is about uh, exactly weight wise, but I don't know if you want him piling up the middle on, on third and two every single time, like he did with Tebow. So I definitely think there is a role for Richardson this season, but I think Jones is your guy going in, into the season here. No doubt. I mean, so you, you talked about experience. I mean, Yes, Emory Jones has more experience, certainly more years in the program, but he doesn't have a ton of an experience advantage over Anthony Richardson. Not in terms when of come, starting. When, well, or even when it just comes to on-field type of stuff. I mean, you look at the overall number of throws, it's less than 100 throws. You look at the rushes, I think it's probably right around 100, something like that. And so it's 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 a couple hundred snaps. It's not nothing, but it's not – it's not some major experience advantage where Jones was having to go up and down the field and, and play major minutes in anything other than that Auburn game. And then the Oklahoma game, which, you know, wasn't, wasn't a whole lot of game, but um, so then you look at that and say, okay, well, if Richardson is showing something in practice where they go, this guy can be special. And this has been one of the things I, I have been <laughs> cautioning people maybe not strongly enough, but I think 2021 is a little bit of a rebuilding year. I, I think, you know, the idea that Florida is going to come in and, and be 11 and one or something like that. I think that's, I think that's going to really depend on getting elite quarterback level or elite quarterback play. And if you, if you can only get that from Richardson, then, and you think you can get it from him, then getting him experience this year to prepare him for next year is a big part of making sure that the program takes a leap. So, you know, I, again, I, I don't, I think I agree with you. I think Emory Jones is going to play a lot. I just think it's interesting that it was never a doubt that Felipe Franks was going to be the starter. It was never a doubt that Kyle Trask was going to be the starter. And now you get this comment to sort of open it up. Yeah. I'm going to sing his praises, but it's still a competition. It, it, it either says something. I, I don't think it says something about Emory Jones. I think it might say something about Anthony Richardson that, you know, that, if Mullen recognizes that he's got somebody who's special, you mentioned right at the start of the segment that, you know, in the days of the transfer pool, you got to make sure those guys are happy. He's, you know, if he really thinks he's special, he's going to have to get him enough playing time to where he stays around and that they're able to keep him happy and, and be able to, to take advantage of the fact that they got a guy special through, through recruiting. Define rebuilding your will. I mean, I, I talking, think we talking like eight and four. I mean, maybe. I, th I think Georgia's clearly a favorite. I think Alabama's clearly a favorite. LSU's a toss-up like it is every year because nobody knows what's going to happen with LSU this year. And then Mullen, we, we talked last week about how Mullen's had some of these duds against like Kentucky, Missouri, and the game they almost lost against South Carolina in 2018. Yeah, I can see that. But I, I think you're probably looking at nine and three. I think that's probably a reasonable expectation. Maybe they get LSU, but then drop something else. Maybe they get LSU and only lose to Georgia and Alabama. Maybe they pull one out against Georgia and Alabama or one of those two. I don't think they go two and zero against those two. I think that's a lot to ask. Yeah, a lot of, there's there is a lot of we need this guy to step up in this position, this guy to step up in this position. A lot, a lot of questions. I see where they are, but I think it's a super talented roster. I'm still excited about the season coming up. All right, let's move on to six bits. Dan Mullen threw out an interesting comment. He just kind of quickly suggested that the the cross divisional games maybe we need to get rid of those. Right now, Florida plays LSU every single year, and they're talking about how the the question came up that it was unusual that, you know, here's Alabama coming to the swamp for the first time in about a decade. And he, that's what set Mullen off to say, Hey, maybe we should get think, rethink how we're doing the scheduling here. And I, I think he has a point. Will. I mean, you look at the way the sec has done the scheduling since the T the league expanded in 2012, Florida, this is only going to be the second time that Florida's playing Alabama in the regular season. They also played them in 2014, uh, an Auburn rivalry that used to be an annual rivalry. We're seeing Auburn once every five years here. I, there's, it's just a very unusual way that it's being done right now. I actually wrote an article a few months back where I said you, you should protect four teams. You protect four teams that you play year in and year out. And for Florida, I had uh, Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, LSU, 
and then you rotate the rest. So you kill the divisions, the top two meet in Atlanta, keep SEC play at eight games because I think that's important to get those non-conference games in. I'm looking forward to future series with Texas and Utah. We just announced one with UCF this week. I'm looking forward to those series. I think that's a good thing. And I think for lesser teams, you think of like, let's go to the Mississippi States of the world, right? Those, those teams need those non-conference games to get bowl eligible a lot of times. And I, I think that's important too. But I, I think if you go with that type of model, you can rotate through with nine, nine different teams. You can see every SEC team home and away play your team within five years. And I think that's a much better model. So I think that, I think that two division model was great for the 12 teams, but as soon as it went to 14, it's, it's just all out of whack. What do you think? I mean, I hate the idea that LSU won't be on the schedule. I mean, if you just go back and look at the actual history of this rivalry going back to – let's go back to 2005. Isn't our best rivalry right now? I mean, it's one of the best, right? If it, I, think, I think it's something like 11 of the last 16 games have been decided by one score or less. You've got all the ridiculous fake punts and fake field goals. A lot of fun. You've, yeah. you've got the 16 to 10 stop at the goal line. You've got last year's debacle when LSU came in and, and took care of Florida, even though they weren't very good. You've got the, the pick six on Burrow back in 2018. You've got Tebow coming on the scene with the jump pass back in 2006. You've got the 51 to 21 with the tip pass to Perth. Percy that he takes in for the touchdown that sort of sets the tone for that 2008 team after the Ole Miss loss. You got the the 28 to 24 loss with Jacob Hester converting all those fourth downs in 2007. I mean, you know, there were, you got the 13 to three game where they were protecting Tebow after he had the the concussion against Kentucky. You just sort of go back and look at all of the different lot games of that, have, that have just been awesome. Yeah, I'm going. Yeah, let's get rid of that. No, I, I, I got to be honest. Every time I've seen Alabama come to the swamp, I mean, we had the Andre DeBose um, bomb. What was that? Like 2009, two, no, 2010 that bombed Andre DeBose. And then the rest of the game was Trent Richardson, six yards at a time, just absolutely demolishing the Florida defense. We've had a few sort of duds against the Crimson Tide, even when, even when it even wasn't real that obvious. Oh, six with Reggie Nelson taking Reggie Nelson uh, with the interception in that game. The first yeah. time they broke out the throwbacks. The, the other thing is, is I, I think, you know, you, you think about major league baseball where they've combined the, the, they've combined the national league and the American league. And the fact that they've done that means that when you're doing interleague play, then when you get to the actual world series, there's not a whole lot that's special about it. I think there's something special about playing an Alabama team in the sec championship game and that being your reward for winning the East. Now, obviously you still had to play LSU and you know, the year before you still had to play Auburn and that sort of stuff. But at the same time, to have a ton of rematches and all that sort of stuff doesn't necessarily appeal to me. I'd rather you win the East. You're the best team in the East, go play the best team in the West. And if Alabama isn't good enough to make it to be to the sec championship game, then you don't play them. The reason we haven't played Auburn that much is because when Auburn's made it to the sec championship game, Florida hasn't. So I, I think when Auburn came to the swamp a few years ago, everybody went, Oh, I remember that rivalry. I remember that being fun. At the same time, I remember the LSU rivalry because that's the one that was really starting to kick up and become important when I was going to Florida. And so, you know, it, we got 20 years now of really, really competitive games with two schools that are really, really close together in terms of recruiting, in terms of sort of their their status amongst the elite in the SEC. And it always makes for an interesting game. So I, I'm hesitant to give that up just so that I can get Old Miss on the schedule a couple more times. But, but let me tell you something. I, I think – you're, you're talking about in terms of keeping the division, you want to keep the divisions and then you don't want to redo the whole schedule entirely. You're, you're just talking about if they just got rid of that crossover game. Cause I'm with you on the LSU game. I want LSU on schedule every single year. I, at this point, I look at them probably the way a Florida fan 20 years ago would have looked at Auburn where that's like kind of our other rival right now. Uh, I think LSU has definitely supplanted Auburn in that space. However, so I, I do think that it'd be cool to get to take a trip to Auburn once in a while, a little more often to, to go to Tuscaloosa or have Bama come in and, and play us a little more. It, it should be more than once a decade. There's something wrong with the system right now. I actually think what they should do is do like the, if, if you're going to revamp the system, do it like the NFL 
where, you know, when, when the Patriots are going 13 and three, the Patriots play the other teams that went 13 and three and won their division. And the goal is to bring them back to the pack so and the rotate team, it every year, rotate well, across the division so, every year. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you're going to do it, do it to That's where if LSU is good and Florida is good, they're going to play each other because they, you know, they were both second in the East and the West, or they were both first in the East and the West. And that's how you determine it. And that's also how you knock down a team of peg, right? So if Alabama has, to, if, if Alabama has to play the number one team in the East, we saw it last year, Alabama beats Georgia, right? right? Georgia's already behind the eight ball, Florida beats Georgia. And then even though they end up with the exact same SEC record, Florida goes to the SEC championship game because of that head to head win over Georgia. Had Georgia gotten old miss instead of Alabama, and had they won that game, then Georgia ends up, that LSU loss cost Florida a shot at the SEC championship game, though we both know Kyle Pitts would have played then. But ir- irrespective, irrespective of that, I guess my point is, is that if if what we want is parity, if the goal is to have more people representing the, the conference, and if the goal is to have interesting matchups, then what's really interesting about Vanderbilt just getting smashed by Alabama on a yearly basis? Give Vanderbilt Arkansas. Right. And, and then when Arkansas gets better and ends up sort of third or fourth in the West, then give them Kentucky or South Carolina or whoever, whoever that is across from them. I think that makes more sense. And then if you've got two teams that are consistently elite, they're going to play each other every year. And so, but when one of them has a down year, so like LSU this year would not be Florida's cross rival because of where they finished in the West, but maybe Florida, well, Florida would get Alabama this year, right? But then Georgia would get Texas A&M. I think that makes for a more interesting, a more interesting connection. If you're going to do it that way, like to try to preserve the rivalries is, is fine. Except that I think you can have a perfectly good, I hate Alabama, LSU, Auburn, and Georgia. And I hate Georgia more than anybody, but you know, I, I, I don't like any of those teams when they come to the swamp or when Florida goes to play them. So I, I don't know that there's like, I don't sit there and go, Oh, I'm pining for Alabama. If Auburn's on the schedule, the only time I'm pining for Alabama and Auburn is when we got Arkansas and Mississippi state on the schedule, because those games don't interest me that much. It's a risk, right? I mean, the team might lose and then you feel bad because you lost to a team that was inferior to yours from a talent perspective, or you win the game and everybody goes, yeah, you were supposed to win that anyway. It's sort of the same thing with the non-conference games, right? I mean, yeah, it's great to play middle Tennessee state and win 63 to three, but the fans want to see that kickoff classic game against Miami or a game against, you know, Ohio state or going out to Colorado and that sort of stuff. That's why Strickland is scheduling those things. So if, if the reason they want to reschedule or the reason they want to adjust things is to make things more, give more parity, I'd, I'd do it based on record. Yeah. I, I think from the parity standpoint, I, I think, I think that would be a good way to handle it. I, I was thinking about too, just in terms of just, being able to see a little more variety. I mean, even like the the divisions don't exact. I mean, they do make sense for the most part geographically outside of Missouri. But I mean, one of the cross division games is Texas A&M South Carolina. What what kind of rivalry do we have in there? What, what's going on with that one? Alabama Tennessee's been terrible for even though that's a historic quote unquote rivalry. Go look at the records on that. That's outside of Peyton Manning playing there and Phil Forman having a few good years while Alabama was down. That's been a pretty lopsided rivalry there. So I, I there's not a ton outside of maybe Georgia Auburn and and uh, Florida LSU. The cross divisional games are not that awesome. I mean, what do we got? Arkansas Missouri. What are we holding on to here? So I think I think we could definitely at least change up how we're doing that. Uh, but I would love to find a way to keep LSU on the schedule, obviously, because <laughs> I, I do say, love that I, game too. Are, are we fixing something that's not broken here? I mean, so have you ever woken up on a Saturday and been like, wow, I don't have any SEC games to watch that interest me? No, there's plenty. There's there, there is plenty, but I think there, I think we could do it a little bit better than what's done. What, what I was about to get to though, is I don't think the divisions themselves, I know we do it geographically, but I'm sorry does Florida, Kentucky, Florida, Vanderbilt get your blood going? I mean, like, do these are these rivalries, or do we just happen to kind of be geographically? They drew a line down the middle. We're kind of on the same side. Like, so I, I the point is, is I, I don't think the East and West is like sacred. It's not a sacred cow that we can't get rid of. I think we can rethink the way we're doing it a little bit, but that's just another way to plug my article on readreaction.com, which I'll put it in the link in the bio. Go check it out. And there you go. Check it out, folks. Yeah, check it out. All right, let's move on to a dollar here, Will. 
Uh, you're you're on Twitter defending Dan Mullins recruiting as usual, just just like every other day. Um, but uh, I, I'm reading this quote here from uh, the Nick Delatore on his Twitter. He said Dan Mullen was asked about battling Alabama, taking all the five stars from Florida. Mullen, uh, I, he says Nick Saban built a great program and has built great consistency. But he said, "quote." Nobody asked my opinion on ratings. Maybe I rate people differently with who, who we go after and who we want, unquote. Damn on, folks. So <laughs> I, I, lo- I love that. That's, that's good. You got to just stick with it. Say, like, I didn't want that guy anyway. So Andy Staples comes in with, Dan, you can't play the nobody asked my opinion on ratings card when the question is, about Alabama getting five stars out of Florida. If Alabama wants them, we know you want them too. Well, Will, this is where you come in out of left field here defending your coach, Dan Mullen. I mean, what is he supposed to say? Is he supposed to say, yes, safe, it's kicking my ass. Like, I, I just don't know what he's supposed to say. Like, I mean, I guess the the thing that that, that people want him to say is, yeah, that's a place we really need to do better. There are things we need to improve on. Right. And we're working to improve on it. And, and you know, that's not Dan Mullen. Dan Mullen does not say, yeah, we're working on something to improve. Hell, he said the defense wasn't that bad last year <laughs> yeah, at SEC Media Days up today. Over it too. I mean, but he's wrong. The defense was terrible last year, and there, there were no signs of progress because we watched the Alabama game, the LSU game, the Oklahoma game, and went, yeah, I guess maybe I was trying to trick myself into thinking we turned a corner against Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, that wasn't really the case. So, again, I go back to what is he supposed to say? He's supposed to say, yeah, we'd much rather have those guys at Alabama than the guys I've got here on my team. Like, uh, no, like he can't say that. So I, I think it's a, it's a disingenuous thing to ask a coach a question about why is your roster? Why like essentially what you're saying is why does your roster suck? And two things, one, his roster does not suck. He's got a lot of really good players on the team. It's just not as good from a talent perspective as Alabama. It's not good as, as good as Georgia. It's not as good as Texas A&M. But we've known that. And anybody who's been paying any attention to Florida knows that while the talent level is higher than it was under Jim McElwain, it is not where it needs to be to be a consistent year in, year out championship level team. But that's the experiment that Dan Mullen's running. It's the experiment that's been going on now for four years. And we keep looking at the recruiting rankings. We keep getting the same result year after year. This isn't a new question. Anybody who's been paying attention to Florida knows that Florida has not been bringing in three, four, five, five-star guys. That He's not recruiting at the, at the Ohio State and Alabama level. I, I just don't know what you want him to say other than, yeah, we'll get it fixed. And we didn't like when Muschamp said that, right? So if, if the coach saying, yeah, we need to fix that is going to get everybody mad, you may as well go out and do what you do and just say, well, look, it's not my evaluations. And then, you know, when he puts half the guys he's recruited in the NFL, he'll be able to say, see, my evaluations are pretty good. And to be honest, he's been doing a pretty good job of taking those McIlwain guys and getting them into the pros. We'll see whether he can do the same thing with the guys he's recruited. Well, this is a guy who had to work pretty hard at a program like Mississippi state to identify talent and bring it in. I mean, he had to go to different places that you don't have to, go to or think about when you're the coach at Florida or the coach at Alabama, but what a hey, will, what if, what if he's using reverse psychology on Nick Saban here? What if he's saying like, yeah, maybe I have a different rating system and Saban's like, well, what is his rating system? And then maybe he'll leave the five stars alone and Mullen will start getting the five stars. You ever consider that for a second? No, no, um, okay. no, gonna, but you at least give it a shot. There. I mean, again, I, I go back to, <laughs> This isn't a surprise. This is now maybe he should have a better answer in the chamber, but I don't know what that answer is. I mean, it was it's sort of the same. I mean, I made I made fun of the way he defended the defense, but again, what are you going to do? Did you, you decide- hear the question on that though? The question the guy asked was it was something where it was basically it was a terrible setup for Mullen, where it was basically he was like, yeah, defense never got together last year. How'd you feel about that? And of course, like you said, is he supposed to? We've talked all last season about the defense struggling. We've talked all off season about the defense struggling and Todd Grantham. I think it's day one of a new year, and Mullins trying to put that behind him. You know what? We got guys on our team. We're going to bounce back. We had some decent performances that stretch last year. Of course, he's going to come back with that. He's going to be defend. He's going to defend his guys, and I think that's all he's doing. Is I think he's defending. 
his staff here, even if it's pretty hilarious. I, I think well, I mean, I mean, to your to your point though, when you ask a loaded question like that, yeah, and you say, "Why was your defense terrible?" Then you have to defend it and say, "Look, it wasn't terrible at all times." We, you know, you, you sort of the we made fact someone that, punt. Well, the fact that the 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 supposition that the defense was terrible is put in front of you means that if you just answer the question honestly, the only thing that gets reported is Mullen agrees that his defense is terrible, which is the same thing with the question when it comes to Saban, right? Why is Saban kicking your butt in recruiting? Dan Mullen admits Nick Saban's kicking his butt in recruiting is the headline that comes out of it. So the defensiveness or the lack of acknowledgement that the question is correct is something you have to do to placate your fan base, to make sure your, your right. players are happy. And Dan Mullen doesn't care what any of us think. He's made that abundantly clear. You don't show up after instigating a fight wearing a Darth Vader mask <laughs> when you care what people think. He doesn't care. And so that is who he is. And love it or hate it, that is who he is. Yeah. And so he showed up at SEC Media Day and people started challenging his program. And he said, no, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to say, look, I got different evaluations and I like my middle linebacker better than the guy they brought in over there. Right. What he should not, do. He's looking to keep it positive and send a message. He's not looking to actually engage and have real conversations about this stuff. Yeah, he, he's not looking for a statistical yeah. breakdown as to how often somebody with more recruit more five star recruits wins. That's for us to do, right? The other thing is there is definitely a, you know, you can't do that to our pledges. Only we can do that to our pledges. Yeah. When it comes to Bullard being asked about recruiting. We can question him because it's our program, but damn it. <laughs> We're going to, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to defend him when it comes to that sort of stuff. And the jury's still out. Kirby hadn't won a national championship either. And so, you know, if Mullen pulls out a win against Kirby, I know I said, I didn't necessarily expect that, but if he pulls out a win against Kirby this year, the noise isn't going to be loud in Gainesville. I mean, Mullen could go two and nine or two and two and 10. And if he beats Kirby, yeah, I think the noise will be louder in Athens, right? I mean, you know, the the, <laughs> the the memes going around where Kirby's got the exact same record as Rick, the exact number number of SEC championships as Rick in their first number, what is it, five years now at, at the university. I, I think that that has legs for a school that hasn't won a championship since 1980. And so there's a lot to be gained from this year if Mullen can can pull out, so, you know, even if it's a squeaker, right? That'll act, actually, uh, I think if he wins by like a field goal against Georgia, that's worse than if he wins by three touchdowns for Kirby because the knock on Kirby is he's going to screw it up when it's a close game. So if you get a close game, maybe there's a little Kirbyism. Florida pulls it out. Now all of a sudden the, uh, the tone at next year's media day, you know, Mullen goes in with his puffed up chest and goes, how do you like my evaluations? And Kirby has to answer all those questions about why do you keep losing 17 to 16? And so th these things switch awfully quickly. And uh, you know, again, you'll never hear me defend Dan Mullen's recruiting ever again, but as of right now, I, it is what it is. And so we've, we've, our bed has been made. We have to lay in it. And these are good players that play for the University of Florida. We'll see whether they can get the job done. That's the challenge, right? If, if he was recruiting at Urban Meyer's level, we'd be like, of course we're going to win. That's the that's the biggest issue Dan Mullen has is that we remember what those recruiting classes were like with Urban Meyer. I mean, the, we were used to being the most talented team in the conference for a long stretch. And to be – yeah, I mean, what, did you just rattle off three teams off the top of your head that were definitely have less talent than according to the recruiting rankings? I mean, like, I, it's – to, to be the fourth or fifth most talented t roster in the conference, that's pretty difficult to swallow on a year-in and year-out basis, especially when you have expectations to win the conference. However, the approach is better. I like his on-field. And, again, like, let's throw him on the field. Outside of Nick Saban, I, are you are you taking – like, I, I mean, Dan Mullen's right up there. He would scare he would scare any opponent on, on any Saturday right now. So, I, I like what we got on our side of the field right now. And I'm with you. He's going to defend his guys, and let, let's let's keep that going for now. I mean, nobody else is winning the SEC either. I mean, it's it's been. Yeah. I mean, I know Georgia got it one year, and LSU got it one year, but it's pretty much been a decade of dominance for Bama, and and so you know, yeah. Obviously, Mullen needs to break through. He needs to win the SEC. I yelled at you last week, asking you when is when is enough enough, and when do you when do you say, hey, this this isn't good enough? But again. I don't know what you expect Mullen to say. He's got the players that he's got. 
he's going to have to roll with them and to throw them under the bus because some reporter put words in his mouth. I, I, I just don't think that's a wise thing to do. And I think he, he avoided taking the bait on that one. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if the, I mean, think about where it's like I, the point I made last week on the bonus episode, we were talking about this uh, saying, I don't, I don't know how many coaches have improved the program as much as Mullen has since he's taken over. And yet he seems he just takes so much heat still, but I mean, that's Florida for you, right? That's Florida. We're always going to, until we get those titles, we're always going to pick and and look at for different ways that we're behind in order to catch up or whatever. So dude, people complained about the 2009 offense after the 2008 championship. Well, we were spoiled like, by we, that 07 and 08 offense, though. Yeah, but we, but we didn't even give him a year grace. It was like the fourth right. game of the year. Like, come on, Adazio, get him out of here. Like, yeah. <laughs> so so we are not a patient group. Yeah. Um, and and Mullen's going to hear that, right? I mean, obviously, if if the game against Alabama goes poorly, game against Georgia goes poorly, game against LSU goes poorly, the noise will be in Gainesville, not in Athens. But um, we'll we'll keep hoping that we get that uh, that we get that seventeen sixteen win over Georgia, so we can. Uh, make fun of Kirby one more year at least I, I would just love to see a Dan Mullen press conference after a win against Bama for so many reasons for so many reasons just I mean what's not, what's he what's the, he dressed up level like? of it's... gloating the level of gloating that's going to occur if Florida can find a way to beat Bama in game Wait, three isn't the Georgia game on Halloween I, it, what, what what does he come dressed up as if they beat Georgia on Halloween <laughs> Does he come dressed as Kirby? Where, like, yeah. get, get a little Kirby pup, puppet on his back, like when get he walks little, in. What, what does he do? I, yeah, I like the Kirby suggestion, but they both wear visors already, so that might get confusing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's for a different episode. All right, man. Good episode today. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, we'll send it out. Thank, thank you, and uh, go Gators. Go Gators. Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. And as always, go Gators.